Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I will say uh, that I'm Mike Witherell. I'm the laboratory director of this great laboratory, and it's a great privilege to be leading what is, I think, a unique laboratory in the breadth of science and technology it's able to do research on. This is the second event in our Women in Science speaker series. Uh, this is something we developed uh, a, about a year ago as an idea. Uh, it's part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion lab-wide initiative and designed to bring women with extraordinary accomplishments in science to talk to our community. Uh, we don't have an agenda about what that uh, conversation is. It, I think, naturally can't, comes out quite well, and we just get these really uh, remarkable and accomplished uh, women to come in and talk to us. So in that light, I would like to uh, welcome Jerry Richmond to the laboratory. She's the Presidential Chair in Science and Professor of Chemistry at the University of Oregon. Uh, as we were saying, she began her academic career at Bryn Mawr College and uh, later moved to the University of Oregon. And she has focused much of her research work on measuring the hydrogen, bond, hydrogen bonding characteristics of water surfaces in contact with a variety of media. She's made discoveries of how molecules behave at air, water, and oil water surfaces. And um, she is one of the world's foremost contributors to our current understanding of the chemical processes that occur at water surfaces. Her professional organization, the American Chemical Society, gave her the Priestley Medal just this year. And as a colleague said at the time of that award, results from her laboratory are instrumental in understanding everything from corrosion science to atmospheric chemistry. She's also been awarded the National Medal of Science, the Joel, Joel, Joel Henry Hildebrand Award, and the Theoretical and Experimental Chemistry of Liquids, the Gav Davison Germers Prize in Surface Physics, an uh, amazingly broad range of awards for her work. Um, she is also a devoted and tireless advocate for women in science and has been a real trailblazer in assuring a diverse workforce. She is the founding and current director of COACH, which is a grassroots organization formed 20 years ago to help women in science and engineering careers. Uh, Jerry has said that with COACH, we have a motto to be rel relentlessly pleasant. So we are relentless and we are pleasant. <laughs> I can add to that, she is also pleasantly relentless, which is a different thing. <laughs> and that is what science needs right now. Uh, 20 years on, COACH has helped to advance the careers of over 20,000 women scientists and engineers in the U.S. and in developing countries around the world. In addition to all that, uh, Jerry has been a leader in the national and international scientific communities, past president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the largest scientific organization in the country. She's on the National Science Board, which is the governing board for the National Science Foundation. Finally, she is secretary and member of the board of directors of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So I had the privilege of being inducted to the American Academy a year ago, and Jerry was responsible for announcing all the new physical scientists. So she started out by waking up the audience with an enthusiastic, let's hear it for the mathematical and physical sciences. And so we, <laughs> our group all led a cheer. And then uh, John Lithgow, the superb and well-known actor, uh, was also on the board, and he followed up with, we can't let them out to us, let's hear it for arts and humanities. <laughs> and so all this meant that for the rest of this group, it was more like a high school graduation environment than a word <laughs> ceremony. Uh, so she properly disrupted the environment there. I'd also, before we bring them up, I'd also like to give a warm welcome to NPR science correspondent Joe Palka, uh, he helped us to lead the conversation for our, our first Women in Science Speaker Series event, Jennifer Doudna, which I thought went extraordinarily well, and we're pleased that we were able to uh, bring him back for this. He's well known for his insightful reporting on science and technology, one of that very small group of uh, journalists who still are dedicated to covering what we do. Uh, he began his journalism career in television, turned to print, and, uh, and he went on to NPR, where, to, where we all hear him regularly. 
Uh, Joe's interest in telling stories not just about scientific discoveries, but about the process led to his program, Joe's Big Idea, exploring how ideas become innovations and inventions. And uh, there are, this has actually gotten a very broad coverage around the country. I will say that in addition, uh, Joe has a feel for the people who do science and technology, and that's an important part of telling the story too. Um, he received his uh, degree from Pomona College, uh, got a PhD in psychology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and we just heard was recently given a very distinguished award at, from Dartmouth Engineering School, actually, for work that he's done. So he's broadening his impact. So please join me in welcoming Joe and Jerry to Berkeley Lab. This is a, this is a great honor for me, and, and really, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, these are, as you heard, the, it's a little open-ended what these conversations are about. I don't, are we going to have questions from the audience? I saw there was a microphone. Okay, so at some point we'll do that. Um, so thanks. You know, as, as I was uh, indulging in a little social media watching before this event, I looked to see that the lab put, put up, you know, this was being announced. And somebody put up a, 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 a response to women in science um, I don't know if this was a troll or whether he was making, or she or whoever it was, was making a serious comment, but he said, what about men in science? And I thought, well, you know, I sort of, I've done that for the last 30 years. <laughs> um, but it made me wonder if there is a more, if there's a deeper question there about what it, why or why this lab, why various places feel the need to talk about women in science, and what's the goal of doing that? What would you like that to accomplish? So I thought I'd start there. Oh, that was a softball question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, well, first of all, it's great to be here. Thanks for asking, and thanks for all of you that are here. So my uh, answer to that is that we know uh, that the best science is done when you have diverse voices, you had diverse expertise. You have diverse experiences in the room solving a scientific problem. And we're not so good at that in terms of uh, the populations that are doing science now in terms of diversity. And so I think it is important that we all work hard to make certain that uh, as many voices and people are at that lab bench or at that table to come up with solutions for the difficult problems that we have. And so if we're uh, underrepresented in any group, I think it's important for us to note that and to work for solutions. But, okay, but let me push back. I mean, there was, there was um, quite a bit of science done 50 years ago or 100 years ago where women and other people were definitely underrepresented and they still managed to accomplish something. So is it your argument that it, we would have gotten further faster if we Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. We would have been on the moon maybe 1900. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I mean, I wonder, I wonder, so how would you measure that? I mean, yes, if we were on the moon, we, we can't go back and do the experiment. But how, how would you, how will you know that that impact is what's, I socially, Responsible, viable, I get it. But how will you know when you've succeeded? Boy, another softball question, huh? <laughs> I don't know that we have metrics in place to be able to do that. Yeah. But I do know that, that, um, I do know that the richer the conversation is, the richer the solution solving is, when you have people that may not be so comfortable with each other. And so that's why it's really, that's really the, the, why we need to make certain that we have everyone at the table. Because when we're all comfortable with, that, which is, with each other coming up with a solution, we come up with the same solution over and over. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true over and over. And, 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 and it's very hard to make people grapple with that. Do you find, because a lot of, especially in science, I find that people are very reluctant to say that they are, they have a bias that might be affecting their judgment, whether it's against male, female, black, white, whatever. It's very, because supposedly there are no, I mean, those 
those distinctions should disappear because the data are the data. Right. But they're still there. So how, how, do you, how do you explain to somebody who says, well, I know we should have diversity, but we only found good male candidates for this position? How do you convince them that no, they... How do you, yeah, how do you, what do you say to somebody who says that to you? Are you sure you had all the best talent in front of you? Right. Are you sure you had all the best talent? That's what I would respond with. Tell uh -huh. me how you're sure you had all the best talent, if there were only males in front of you. Because I face this question now where um, I've looked at the percentage of women versus men that I interview over the years. And, and I specifically looked in the last five years. And I think I've been, my best year was 38% or 37% women. But if you go to the Lawrence Berkeley Lab press office or a lot of university press offices and they announce something, a lot of times it'll be the PI that you are, in, are introduced to and the PI tends to still be a man. Mm -hmm. So what's the role of, what's my role in terms of saying, well, I know I could talk to the PI, but I'd rather talk to the grad student who actually did the work. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's great, but I always think it's important for us to give more credit to the grad students because they're doing all the work. So what's, <laughs> so, so wait a minute. So what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> Have you not, didn't you get fully indoctrinated in, no, never mind. Okay. Um, all right, so enough of the hardball questions. Let's go okay. back to the softball. When, <laughs> You were at Bryn Mawr when? I'm just curious. 80 to 85. 80 to 85. On the faculty. First female oh, tenure track faculty member at Bryn Mawr Women's that's College. That's right. It was faculty. Because <laughs> I, I was going to say I was at Swarthmore, but, but before you were on the faculty there. But you didn't go there as an undergraduate. You, you no, no, no. I went to Kansas State. OK, so how do, OK, so what, what was it at Kansas State that started you on the path that you're on today? Oh, it's undergraduate research. There's no question. Okay. There's no what, question. What did you do? Oh my gosh. <laughs> do you really want to know? <laughs> I think people came here because, yeah, they want to hear about that stuff. I could be wrong. Maybe they want so, to hear. <laughs> so I originally was going to be a math major. My mom was a beautician. My dad was a farmer. So I had no idea what science was at all. No idea. But my mom always said, be good at math because that'll take you places. And so I went to college and I majored in math. And I was working my way through college, so I was working retail. I was actually selling wigs to men. Well, we won't go that further. <laughs> anyway, it was the 60s, and the guys wanted to have long hair, but they couldn't because they were in the Army. Anyway, um, so, I went to, so I was doing this job uh, on the side, and so I was also taking chemistry, and chemistry, the chemistry professor noticed me in the sophomore year, and he said, you just aced this chemistry, analytical chemistry exam, and um, who are you? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I'm a math major. And, and he said, um, well, smart students like you, like you, we'd love to have you need a job. <laughs> we'd love to have you working in the chemistry department doing things. So I said, a job? Um, mm -hmm. Sounds great. And so he said, well, you have to be a, it's good if you're a chemistry major if you take this job. So I switched and became a chem major. And part of that then, in terms of what turned me on to science and chemistry was that I worked in a guy's lab. His name's Cliff Malone. And um, he, was, he had the coolest projects going on. And remember, this is Kansas, OK? So the project he was working on was to take, now this may be after lunch, not so good. <laughs> he was taking, he wanted to make, uh, he wanted to have insecticides to kill bugs in the farm field, but he didn't want to have to spray crops. So his idea was to make plastic cow pies we know what cow pies are. Mm -hmm. We do not eat them. Uh, plastic cow pies and put them in the field. And then you put the insecticide on the cow pies that would attract the flies. And then once they land on the artificial cow pies, they would die. OK? So what do you have to do to get flies to come to an artificial cow pie? You have to find out what the chemical is for the smell of regular cow pies. <laughs> and so in his laboratory, he had all these blenders <laughs> chewing up cow pies, real cow pies, and then extracting the smell. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he did isolate it, and he got a patent on it. But the other thing he had going on in his laboratory was he, had, he was convinced that every mother in this country would want to send their child off to camp 
with snake repellent. Right? And so he was into then finding a snake repellent. And so that meant having snakes around the lab in cages in order to figure out what snakes don't like. Now, would this like heaven on earth in terms of undergraduate research? Oh, yeah. I don't think anybody would doubt that <laughs> coming into the lab every day and extracting the perfume of a cow pie. <laughs> that's why sometimes I have a hard time explaining why scientists like their work to the public. Oh. <laughs> but, what, okay, I, you know, it's funny that you say it's so cool because it is so cool, but, but can, you, can you go a little deeper? I mean, yeah. why was it because with your background of, of coming not from a science background, not right. necessarily being taught to appreciate the natural world or the mysteries right. of the world. How, do you, how did that come to be? How did, you, how did it, that mystery come to you as being important? Well, I, you know, it was, it was entertaining at first mm -hmm. to be in Cliff's lab. Um, but then I started taking uh, chemistry courses. And I took, for those older people in the audience, organic chemistry was taught out of Morrison and Boyd, little green yeah. book, OK? I had that. Yeah, I swear to God, I loved Morrison and Boyd. I could sleep with it at night. If I loved learning organic chemistry and just visualizing everything. And it's the first time I ever thought of writing to authors and saying how much I loved their novel, only it wasn't a novel. It was the organic chemistry text. And then I took physics, and that just sucked me in even deeper. And so I just, I just fell in love with, uh, with the science. And I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I mean, I did it 24-7. I just got sucked into it, and I just the intellectual challenges, and the, it was like solving puzzles all day long. And then I started doing research in an organic chemistry laboratory, and then I moved on to a physical chemistry laboratory, and so I worked in three different undergraduate labs. And then I worked here at Berkeley for a summer in undergraduate research. I worked at Vermont for a summer at IBM. I mean, you know, this whole I never gotten on an airplane before till I flew to Vermont. I mean, right. it was just this whole world opened up that that um, just completely changed my life. So, so did you perceive a bias against women in those days? Or was it not obvious to you that that existed? Well, Joe, that's a really good question. Um, an event, something happened to me when I was in my uh, junior year in college. And that was I um, really wanted to work in a particular professor's laboratory. And I was acing his course. But um, he wouldn't let me work in his laboratory. And so one of the other professors in the department uh, said to me, Jerry, it's not about you. He doesn't let girls work in his lab. And I was really taken back by that. And it happened almost coincidentally with a course that I had enrolled in. And the course, so as a science major, I just wanted to do science. I didn't want to do this humanities and social science stuff. So I was going through the catalog to figure out what course I could take that would keep my interest that, you know, was in, in this philosophy or something. Mm -hmm. And I found this course called Sex and Politics. So I thought, hmm, Sex and Politics, that might keep my interest, 21, <laughs> uh, 20. But it turned out to be an early feminism course. Femi feminism did make it to Kansas by 1974. And, um, <laughs> And it, w it was an eye-opener because in that we had discussions about how um, there can be biases against women in male-dominated fields. And I thought, male-dominated fields, gee, let's see, there were four of us in my calculus class of three or four hundred. I guess it is kind of male-dominated. <laughs> and, um, and it was just an eye-opener. And then I, I said, oh, my god, it's not me. It's, it's other people biases. So, and then, so that was really the eye-opener. It was really when I started working on uh, women and science issues that early. Hmm. And um, because I wanted to see us all at the table. But it was, it was really an eye opener for me. I just suddenly things fell into place and I figured it out. And then we went off to graduate school and here at Berkeley. And there were some challenges there. But. Yeah, so OK. But you never did get into this person's lab at no. Kansas. And what about here at Ber Berkeley? Did you said there were some challenges. Well, there were challenges because we, um, because we're so small in number in in uh, chemistry. I think there were twelve or thirteen of us out of fifty some 
uh, graduate students in the incoming class. And, um, but I felt my research director, who was George Pimentel, was, was very welcoming. Um, and so the challenges were more just um, dealing with other people around, but in terms of my advisor, I always felt he was very supportive. One, I mean, I was reading uh, about George Pimentel and your relationship to him, and at least in Chemical and Engineering News, they talked about that you found his uh, hands-off, uh, letting you find your own way. Um, did that? Did you ever feel lost in that? I mean, sometimes you need to be guided in a graduate experience, and I got a little lost in mine, but maybe you didn't in yours. <laughs> Oh, I think as a graduate student, uh, you know, graduate school is to, part of the motivation behind graduate school is to lower your confidence level as low as it can <laughs> possibly go. Um, so, so lost is, uh, is, you know, goes with the, with the program. Um, but I think you also uh, work through it. I had taken off um, six months before I went to graduate school to just hitchhike around Europe by myself, and I, I got a lot of um, confidence in my abilities to manage myself and manage my time. Um, but uh, there were times when it was hard, but God, I couldn't have been happier. I mean, I, uh, I learned how to use the machine shop, and I was building <laughs> this laser, and I had these capacitors, uh, you know, like three foot tall, and they discharge in a few microseconds, and they put out this big blast, and they're chemicals that exploded and you know there are a lot of other things to worry about in that research project other than discrimination it was like a lot of other things going on but I also have to say here in the audience with me is this husband Steve Cavan who's been with me since the first day of graduate school and and uh, he's you know looking up uh, rolling his eyes but uh, it was wonderful to have him as a support system too yeah I'm just I, I, I it, it does make me feel that the, the women in science is almost a societal thing that has to be everybody in science at some level. I mean, we, men have to be part of the change yes. or it's not going to work yes. very effectively. That's right. Anyway, um, so you got your PhD, you went to Bryn Mawr and taught for a while. And what, had research going on there too. And had research. So what was your research originally? Well, um, it started out by looking at, well, I was, because I was in graduate school, I built this chemical laser, and that was in the early days of lasers, and so I was very excited about seeing what I could do with lasers, and so when I went to Bryn Mawr then, I um, got enough money to put together a dye laser and, a, uh, and be able to study, first of all, studied some, some work with biological systems, uh, metal binding to protein systems, and, but then got very interested in being able to study the surface, electrochemical processes, the study of metal surfaces using laser systems. So, so I guess I'm going to be, I'm going to allow myself to ask, be dumb for a second because I'm good at that, and ask what a chemical laser is. Ah, thank you for asking the question. So um, these days, uh, most people that use lasers are used to thinking about shooting a, a light beam at something off the laser add a chemical to make the chemical do something mm -hmm. or cha change its structure. In this case, a chemical laser is one in which the chemistry goes on inside the laser, and then it puts out a certain kind of light. And so in this case, what I was producing was uh, very excited uh, HF molecules, which then lased. So then the light that they gave off then would bounce off one mirror and the other mirror, and then I would be detecting the color of the light that came off it to understand the kind of excitement that was happening with this HF molecule once I blasted it with, well, actually, I made it from CLF and H2, put them together, flashed it, made HF, then looked at the light that came off of the HF. What took you out to Oregon? So I loved my time at Bryn Mawr. I had uh, great students that were there, um, and, but it, I, it was a combination of both teaching and research. Um, but I realized that the research was a lot more important to me than, than the teaching, which I didn't anticipate after graduate school, because I didn't take a postdoc. I went straight from graduate school to, uh, to Bryn Mawr. And um, then I, and I had some great ideas of, of what to do to make a, a research program. And so uh, then um, Steve, was my husband, was at Bell Laboratories. And so we both decided 
uh, that it was, you know, we might consider a move. And so uh, we looked around and had some offers and, and decided Oregon was the best for us. And so uh, because of its interdisciplinary nature of the science. And so we, I uh, went and uh, expanded my research program, started out doing the electrochemistry oriented work with lasers and then went on to uh, a few years later to be studying liquid surfaces, but always with uh, fancy laser systems. Okay, and explain, explain what it is. I, I was again reading this, this notion of the interface, this, the, the, connect, the space, the connection between water and whatever's on top of it or whatever it's on top of. Why is it important to know about that? Well, if we're talking about, if we're talking about something like, a, let's say, an air water interface, your glass of mm -hmm. water here, you know, I look at the, the surface as really the doorway to anything getting into that, that water, whether it be carbon dioxide in the air or whatever. But there's, um, there is this sur high surface tension, right? Things sit on top of water, leaves and bugs. And so the very surface layer is a bit of a door in order for things to get inside. But what makes that top layer any different than 10 or 15 molecules down or five molecules down. There's something got to be really special about that top layer. And if that top layer is the doorway and you're trying to look at how <coughs> different pollutants or atmospheric processes happen, we want to know whether they just bounce off or whether they actually stop and absorb a while or go in because it really controls the reactivity of most of the chemistry that, we, that goes on inside of here. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be able to understand what's happening on the top to better understand what happens when they go in and react. So are, are there ways of changing the surface tension of the water so that things can get in more easily? Uh, yes. Yes. You put, uh, in fact, a lot of different molecules can go on top. And the most, the most common is a soap um, because that's, you know, that's how soaps work in breaking down that surface tension on water. And then it makes it easier for everything to to go in. Will you see a different signal with your laser analysis of the nature of the interface when you have a water with a surfactant on top of it versus water without a surfactant yes. on top of it? Yes, big time changes. Right. Big time changes. And so would you be using that knowledge to make different surfactants or better surfactants or just to understand what surfactants do? So in the surfactant industry, um, you know, we have surfactants in your toothpaste, in your shampoo, and, you know, different formulations. Why? Well, okay. they figured out why, but the why is by just trying different stuff. Mm -hmm. So what's not really understood is what kind of molecular structure mm -hmm. makes a surfactant do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. So you can't say... I want Joe to take to use toothpaste that's really good, so let's put in a sulfonate in that uh, in his toothpaste to make it work well because we know the molecular properties of that sulfonate do this and that when it comes to water. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know that, and that's what we study. So there's more predictability as to what molecule will give you what function. Hmm. So we don't make we don't make the surfactants to make the function but we try to understand which, what the structure needs to be in order to have, for example, to make the surface tension a lot different. So why, I mean, but I, I'm just curious, what, what property of toothpaste would be enhanced by a surfactant? Oh, being able to scrub gunk off your teeth. I see. So you're, you're studying the gunk water interface. <laughs> Well, in many respects, that's the other side of the research, was just the oil-water interface. Yeah. Because well, you're trying to break that, that junction between oil and water. Break the junction? Yeah. Why? Because you want, the, you want to be able to break the oil up. So you want to be able to, I mean, that's how an oil dispersant works in a, an oil spill, is to be able to put a surfactant there and, may, and get the, the oil to break up into smaller particles, these tiny droplets, where water is surrounding a tiny oil droplet that's stabilized by this surfactant so that it can wash away or bugs can eat it or whatever. When did your work start to get attention? 
Um, I would say probably, um, probably our 2001 science article mm -hmm. was the one that brought the most attention to it. And that article was saying that normally uh, in the past people have thought when you put water next to oil that you, um, that actually water would ball up in itself and wouldn't want to have anything to do with oil. That's a lot of the biological text. And yet theoretical work said that when water is next to oil, you're going to have a big vacuum. You're going to have a vacuum layer, hmm. not huge, but a vacuum layer. And what our work showed actually was when you have water molecules next to oil, that they actually straddle the junction between the oil and the water, and, and they bond to the oil, weakly, weakly bond to the oil. And that sets up really interesting properties at an oil-water interface that wasn't uh, really expected to be able to see that bonding with the oil. So where, where, where does that go from chemistry to physics? Oh, it's it's a combination of chemistry and physics. Okay. Because it was a combination. We started doing theoretical work along with the experimental work, so it brought it all together. And so these these this coach, what's tell talk a little bit more more about that. So in the nineties, uh, late nineties, I was noticing in, in chemistry that there were um, a lot of, uh, I was kind of mid-career, uh, full professor at that point, but I was noticing that there were a lot of, you know, that was a time where people were getting awards and accolades and for what they were doing and invited talks and offers to go to another university. And there were very few women that were getting acknowledged for in that way, even though they were doing as well as the men were doing in terms of publications and so forth, but they just weren't getting the recognition. Hmm. And so I got a group of uh, a dozen senior women chemists from around the country, and we got the, the Dreyfus Foundation gave us some money to start talking about what um, the challenges that we were facing and what we might do about it. And uh, so we got together the first time, and. Everyone was saying, oh, no problem for me. It's perfectly fine, and it's okay. And so, um, but they did see some, some issues. So then it was a busy group of women. And so the next meeting, we, had, we were funded for four meetings. The second meeting, I, everybody was busy. We all had small children and everything else. And first of all, the first meeting, most of the women had never been in a room full of other women scientists before, even chemists. So this was unusual. But the second meeting then, we brought in a, a team of um, a couple of women that were not scientists, but they were good at, at teaching uh, professional skills development. So they did a workshop for us on negotiation. Hmm. And um, in this negotiation, we were supposed to describe the challenges that, you know, that we had that a negotiation might help with. And then all the stories came out. One woman was losing her lab space, even though she had, out, you know, she had everything was going great. Another woman was being denied for this particular promotion. All these stories came coming out. So we realized we were all in denial uh, in the first meeting. And uh, so they gave us, we worked through these um, problems with them. And when we came back six months later, everyone's lives had changed. The woman got her space back. Just everyone's lives had changed. And so I said, wow, this is pretty cool. So uh, we need to start offering these to other women scientists. What, uh, uh, what happened at that meeting that uh, empowered the women to reverse some of the negative things? What, what changed? To taking control. Okay. It's all about taking control of your career, rather than assuming that someone else will take it, care of you. It's all about taking control. And, uh, and it's not just for, for women either. I mean, it's for everyone that's, uh, everyone being, but enabling, taking control while also working within the system to make it work. Hmm. So a lot of really good advice. So we've uh, then, so we've then got funding from NSF, NIH, and Department of Energy, and then have then uh, started, have other workshops on leadership and uh, communication. And so we then start offering them all over the country. and. At professional meetings, we've done them here at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and uh, and then about seven. And we continue to have an advisory board that has grown, and now it's not just chemistry; it's across all the different engineering and science disciplines. And, um, and that's where all these women have come to. So, what? Give me a report card. How are we doing in 2018? Well, we just did a, a survey, um, and in chemistry. Uh, not much improvement in the last 10 years in terms of climate in departments. Numbers are going up slowly, um, slowly. And chemistry is one of the better players relative to some of the other disciplines. So we're still, tr we're still 
have challenges ahead. And we're better, we're better at the undergraduate level and even graduate student level, but it's really getting women into leadership roles where it's, the real challenge continues. So the, is this, I mean, I have a, I have a friend who's a, a department chair at Hopkins, and she's pointed out to me that you see the drop off most precipitously when you go from associate to full professor. It's at this very highest level. So uh, without holding up a mirror to myself, what would you say is the biggest barrier uh, to this? I mean, what's, what's happening? I mean, the NSF is saying it, the NIH is saying it, the Department of Energy is saying it, the foundations are saying it, the society is saying it. It's not happening. That there needs to, that this has to change. What has to change to have to make this change? Well, I think that now a focus on um, the issues of implicit bias and how we all have biases, making people more aware of that. But I think even more important is that leadership at our institutions certainly have to be driving and monitoring, and that means collecting data on progress and watching to see that you're making progress. But I also worry a lot about the trenches. So I worry a lot about what happens in, in the department, in the faculty member's laboratory, where you can have weird things that go on that don't get reported because of fear of getting reported because it may ruin your career. Mm -hmm. And so I worry about that level, but I also uh, worry about the, the fact that um, that women oftentimes, uh, that there's uh, biases against them reaching leadership positions, but women have to also work harder to accept leadership positions if they yeah. so feel that they can do it. So in speaking with some of my female colleagues, we were discussing the fact that this event is taking place within the realm of a women in science series rather than a people in science series. Um, how do you see the role of series or awards or other things dedicated to women in science specifically? Well, I think that's a really good question. And uh, as Joe and I talked about before, when can you quit doing that uh, as opposed to just having uh, regular awards in science? But I've seen the impact that, that um, giving more visibility to women can have, at, especially at the early stages of their careers, where you're just trying to build up your CV in any way that you possibly can. So let's just celebrate the fact that there are awards out there at all. Um, someday we hope to be able to not have to celebrate uh, women in science or African Americans in science. And, um, but we're not there yet, so let's celebrate. You know, the more parties you can have, the more celebrations, the better. I believe. That's a good question. Thanks for coming. Um, so I guess I'm curious. So what impact on your career has there been for doing coach? Has it been a positive or a negative? Well, it's interesting um, because in the early days of starting coach, um, I was told not to, I was hmm. advised not to, because it would look as if I wasn't so serious about my science. And, um, but I just couldn't, do, I just couldn't. I mean, I can't. Science is wonderful, and doing science is wonderful, but I need something else, too. And I, our experiments are really, really, really hard. And so I tell people that I have the option of either constantly haranguing my students to get, make the results come faster, or I can go do something else for a while and check back in with them and uh, keep my stress level lower. Um, so, but overall, it was, it was wonderful winning the National Medal of Science where it was acknowledged that I was winning both for my science as well as for our activities on women in science. And so, and so that was really gratifying because um, it showed a, 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 a recognition that both can be important. And I think that's the strong message that we want to give to, to our younger scientists and everyone else, that, that it's OK to do your science and something else too, because maybe your life will be richer that way. On the other hand, just doing science is rich too but personalize it in some way. I'll take one question myself. And to, if so for, um, for a chemistry department, and you know quite a few of, do the women who are faculty members have more uh, female graduate students than the men in the department? Just okay. on, on exploring, is that your experience? In my department? Yeah. 
No, I wouldn't say so, actually. I'd, I'd say um, no. Okay. No, uh-uh. I wouldn't say so. Okay. You know, I have to say, though, to finish up with that, is that whenever I've had a group that was uh, a little too male, then too much stuff got broken. <laughs> <laughs> But when it's too many women, not enough stuff gets broken. I won't, I won't follow up on that. Go ahead. <laughs> Was there a point when you realized you had to readjust your expectations for yourself and realize that they were hindered by what others expected from you and that you were capable of going beyond that? Or was it realizing that others' expectations of you were scaled below what you thought you were capable of? Or did you ever have an experience like that? Let's see, where I, I had to adjust that their expect, do it again. That you realized that your expectations for yourself were hindered by what others, like male scientists, thought you were capable of, and you had to personally realize that there was more you No, this do. was all me. There was a point where I realized that actually I was better than I thought I was. Yeah. And that was more the turnaround. That was more the turnaround. And I don't think it was based at all on what other people uh, thought as much as, and maybe you can say, well, you know, whatever I internalized had some social influence to it too. Um, but once uh, that was a, a phase transition, yeah. Okay. So I have I have one more issue about another issue of implicit bias, theoretical and experimental. In physicists, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, theoretical physicists are considered smarter than experimental physicists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So exper physicists do experiments so theoretical physicists can win Nobel Prizes. How does this go in chemistry? <laughs> this is why you do both. <laughs> it's very interesting, can't, though. Can't get ready to take that one on. <laughs> but, it, but it's interesting you say about expectations. I, I think that question is interesting because I've seen at NPR, they, they, they've asked us to self-evaluate. You know, we write these evaluations, and I routinely write, greatest science reporter known to humanity. <laughs> and it's partly because I, I believe that, but partly just because um, you ask me your, my opinion of me, it's going to be good. And, and I talk to a lot of my female colleagues, and they're, yeah. they're being far more honest. Oh, I have flaws here, flaws there. And I'm going, yeah, but that's not, that's yeah. not, this, this exercise is being, you're supposed to be a star in, yeah. in this self-evaluation world, or why, you know, if somebody else doesn't think you're doing a good job, fine. But if you don't think you're doing a good job, that's not good. So I, I just, I, I, I want to, I want to, I just, I feel that I've known women that are far more competent than I am, but they don't seem to know it. Right. And uh, I wish there was a way, and now, now that I'm working with a young woman who is far more competent than I am, I hate her, <laughs> but but I'm trying to deal with it. <laughs> okay, Susan. Um, yeah, I wanted to make a comment, and then I had a scientific question. The comment was what I found scientifically is that when you work with people from different fields and different areas, it's like a symphony of ideas, and they build on each other, and they they it's like a Picasso where you have all these viewpoints that you try to assemble into a, a, a scientific idea, it's probably as, as scrambled as a Picasso, but, but you try to do that. I think that's what women also bring, or, or you know, underrepresented minorities, they bring in instruments that are rich and, and can add. And the question I had was a, a very simplistic question, and I was curious, what's the difference between an air-water interface and an oil-water interface? Ah, oh, good uh, question. Yeah. Um, the oil water interface, um, it's just there's, there's, it's similar in some respects, except you've still got that oil layer that's bonding to the, weakly, to the water. And so the properties of that interface is different because you actually set up a bit of a field that's thing to draw things in. And, um, and so it, it's different from a very molecular level, but in some respects, uh, similar. It's just you've got the suppression of the oil that is there. But soaps still act in similar ways. Okay, got one over here. To, uh, to Mike's previous question about, uh, about um, 
whether theoretical or experimental. <laughs> you know, I, I, Jerry's, I know re, Jerry's response is, is spot on. This is why we do both, right? <laughs> to have multiple perspectives there. And as somebody who very much enjoyed your summer undergrad program back in he did, 94, he did. the amazing thing about that setup compared to where I'd been before was that the chemistry and the physics was all mixed up. Oh. It, there, was not, you know, there were very few barriers between things. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, there. Here's a, yeah, I've got a, yeah, I've got a few. Go ahead. Um, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I work with the undergrads who come here to do internships at the lab, and I was happy to hear that endorsement about undergraduate research at the beginning. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, for our undergrads, we really um, encourage them to develop professional relationships with mentors, researchers who know more than them. And I'm wondering if you could just speak about the role mentoring has had in your professional career, certainly beyond um, your undergrad days. So I would have to say that I, I don't really know that I had that much of a... We had another question uh, over here. I want to get the mic there. Um, I don't know um, that I really had what you would call a long-term mentor. Um, but I had a lot of coaches, and I had a lot of sponsors, and so um, and so they've had a huge uh, they've had a huge impact, and so you can have a mentor that's short term coach, you can have someone that is out there as a cheerleader for you, and I've had both of those, but not so much a long term. But it, and how do you fold friendships into that? You know, wonderful friendships of other scientists over the years have been valuable too. Okay. Thanks. I think we have two people holding mics, and I think we'll get to both of them, and that'll probably be uh, at the end, so first here and then there. So you talked about how, like, even in the undergrad classes, you had less women, let's say, in calculus and the similar classes. So do you think there is um, a way to encourage women at a younger age, because you say that at associate level, between associate level professorship to full professorship, you see a drop. But I also see that there is also low interest at the beginning. Yes. So how, what is your comment on that? How can we you know, increase the interest of you know, young women and maybe uh, unrepresented um, minorities to get involved? Is there something they get in the lower when they're younger where they don't feel as interested in science and technology? Or like, what's your comment? Yeah, that? so I, ca I can't really speak so much through the K through 12 level. Um, I mean, there are, but I think the sooner you can get any student hands-on experience and uh, get involved in even undergraduate research, you know, it's, our retention rate for underrepresented groups is just abysmal. And so we have to work on that retention rate uh, for them, more so than our majority groups. And I do believe that by getting involved in res undergraduate research as soon as possible, you then have, if you're in a good group, you have a good mentor, you have graduate students around you, you have I just, and, or if you're even at an undergraduate institution, getting some hands-on is really, really important. And feeling like you're part of something, I think, is really important. And for me, that's what saved me, was to, to get me in a, a kind of a family environment like some of our, many of our research groups can be, that are showing you where you're going to go after next year and the next year and the next year. Because, you know, if you're from a background like mine, you have no idea what's going to happen next year or the next year or the next year. And so having people around me that showed me what I would be doing if I stayed on this pathway made a huge difference. Because there was no reason for me to to gone on this pathway if I hadn't had that experience of people around me. OK, then we'll have our final question. Uh, OK, so kind of going off of what you said, that when you were a child, or like even now, you feel as a man that you can say you are great, you are amazing, but when you talk to female coworkers or anyone, they more point out their flaws. But I think that's something that is comes from when you are young, that as a boy, or at least when I was a kid, seeing the boys, they were constantly um, encouraged, like, you can do it, you're great. And as a girl, you were constantly said that, no, this isn't what you can't do. You're not good enough, you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, you're too colored. Um, like, that's... I don't know if that's something that you've ever considered or if coach or any of the programs that you've um, been in experience or participated in reaches out to kids, um, as what was said before, that um, going towards the younger children, bringing them into the field or their interest, telling them they can do it, not just boys versus girls, but anyone that they can do it. Um, what are your comments on that? Well, I think that's critically important. And I think parents make a, play a huge role in that. I mean, if it weren't for my mother, 
who, you know, was encouraged me. She showed me she could do math, arithmetic faster than I could. She taught me my first chemistry lesson in the beauty shop. She would bring out bottles of hair dye, and she would point out which elements on the periodic table were on, those hair, that, on that hair dye. I mean, you know, those kind of things stuck with me and kept me going. So I think parents have a huge role to play in that. And then it was my eighth grade math teacher. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for my eighth grade math teacher, Mr. Smallsreed, who pulled me out of the class and had me do a geometry uh, problem on the board and said it was in a way he'd never seen it before. Very creative. Now start to tear up. Um, and that made a huge difference because my counselor had told me a few days before that that because I was good at taking math exams and could write fast, I should be a secretary. <laughs> so, you know, the fact that I, you know, I had this one teacher that said, oh, no, you should, you should go into math, made a huge difference. Otherwise, I'd still be doing shorthand and bookkeeping and everything else. Thanks for asking that question. Okay, I think that's probably the right place to end up. So Great. I would like to thank both Jerry and Joe. Great, thank you. Okay, and I would also like to thank all the people who asked the great questions and uh, look forward to uh, getting together and doing this again in six great. months or so. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.